Now we would like to introduce Dr. Sydney Jen, Librarian of the Education University of Hong Kong Library. Dr. Jen will chair this plenary session on the sustainable resources. Dr. Jen, please. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, good afternoon, colleagues. Okay, I believe you all enjoy the wonderful food. Um, once again, I'm Cindy Chang from the Education University of Hong Kong. Um, we are the youngest university in Hong Kong. Technically, <laughs> technically speaking, okay, at UHK did not exist last week. <laughs> Thank you. So I, it's my great honor okay, to chair this plenary section on sustainable resources. Okay. Today we are very glad to have our keynote speaker, Ms. Helen Hock Yu, Director of Global Web Service of Internet Archive. Her title, uh, the title of her presentation today is Web Archiving, Practices and Options for Academic Libraries. So allow me to give a brief introduction of Ms. Ms. Uh, Hock Yu. Ms. Helen Hock Yu joined the Internet Archive in September 2015. And before that, she has various roles at, the, at UK national organizations and obtained extensive experience in web archiving. Uh, digital preservation and in IT program management. As the head of web archiving at uh, the British Library, uh, Helen led the British Library's web archiving activities from year 2008, building the library's capacity for archiving the UK web at large scale, and from uh, 2013, implementing a legal deposit for over 4 million UK websites. And she has published and spoken extensively about web archiving addressing national and international audiences at various academic and professional conferences. Helen was also the project manager of the Panet uh, Project, co-funded by the European Union under the SIG Framework Program to address uh, core digital preservation challenges. Before joining the British Library, she worked at HESP, uh, as a program manager at the UK Joint Information System Committee overseeing the committee's research and development activities in the area of digital preservation. So please, join me in welcoming Helen. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am privileged and delighted to be here. So in the next hour or so, I would like to tell you about web archiving, something, well, an important part of my life for the last nine years. So I would like to share some of the practices and what I know about web archiving. I didn't know how to pitch the talk. I thought maybe the best would be uh, to cover the basics. And then we'll examine the web archiving landscape globally. We'll look at the key approaches and some of the challenges. And then I'll give you an int a brief introduction of the Internet Archive. And then we'll look at a couple of case studies which involve academic libraries who actively undertake web archiving, looking at how, why, and how they sustain such a program. And then I'll conclude the talk by looking, some, looking at some key, uh, key considerations which, are, I, which I think are quite different, uh, different for academic libraries in comparison with Internet Archive or national libraries. So, web archiving refers to the selecting, capturing, storing, preservation, and management, managing access to web resources over time. So there is a notion of longevity, authenticity, reliability, and future useness of the archival material underlying uh, here. And also, I think this is where the um, traditional stewardship associated with libraries and archives come into play. So this uh, web archiving was started by the Internet Archive in 1996. Uh, it's essentially, uh, when it started at least, a very technical process. So, so a crawler software is used to download web resources automatically. And then these are stored in an archival format and access uh, is provided by replaying the archived content. So I'll show you an example just to give you an idea how an archived website looks like. Sorry. So here's the, um, 
So in the uh, Internet Archive's web archive, the um, university's library web page has been archived 600, 631 times between December 10, 1997 and May the 2nd, 2016. So I don't know if this rings bells. Some of you, I think some of you recognize this. So this is the earliest memory of your library website. And it has evolved to become this. So while the URL representing that content has not changed, the content hosted under that URL has changed over time. So this is one of the reasons why archived web pages can tell you how things evolve on the web. And at the larger scale, you can gather information about the national web space, the global web. So that's also one of the reasons why people archive the web. It is considered information resources, but ephemeral by nature. It changes. And in the worst case, it goes offline without, any, without even you knowing about it. And at many, in many countries, uh, archived, web archives are considered, or the web, web publications are considered published national heritage. There are laws in place to enable the at-scale preservation uh, of this material. Also, I think it has become more and more clear that this, can, this type of material, web archives, they are historical and sociological data that may not be found elsewhere. So it does have research values. So in the, later on, I'll show you some um, researches based on using archived websites. The government, public records office, um, private organizations, they also archive the web, you know, because of regu regulatory compliance, litigation readiness reasons. And um, very importantly, especially for an acad academic library, cited um, references on the web disappear. So in order to preserve scholarly work, you have to make sure that the referenced materials are preserved as well. So there are quite a large uh, community now engaged in web archiving, mostly heritage and memory institutions, including national, national libraries and archives. Governments archive their records as well, and uh, many academic libraries, there are commercial organizations, individual scholars and activists. So we've seen the library's webpage, and now we're going to have a brief look at the global web archiving landscape. So, so far, the Internet Archive's Wayback Machine is the largest and oldest web archive in existence. So, hands up if you have heard about the web Wayback Machine before. Thank you, that's great. Um, there are probably, ne you know, so the, the web Wayback Machine is known because of its uh, global struct scale and also uh, unrestricted access. There are also many web archives operated by national libraries and heritage organizations. For them, the goal is to preserve national heritage. So there are currently 30 plus national libraries which have a web archiving program. And um, some of them, about 20 plus of them actually archive the web uh, under legal deposit. Uh, I have given a couple of examples there to illustrate how government and corporate web archives come, um, preserves records over time. So here is the, uh, there is the UK government web archive operated by the um, UK National Archives. And there is also the uh, website archives of EU institutions, which is the historical archives of the European Union and the public, uh, publications office of the European Union. There are many research-driven web archives. Uh, later on, we'll look into that. But these are mostly operated by university libraries. Uh, the Human Rights Web Archive at the Univ um, Columbia University's library is one of the case studies I'm going to talk about later. And also, there is the Digital Archive for Chinese Studies, which is a collaboration between Leiden University in the Netherlands and Heidelberg University in Germany. They have archived material relevant 
to Chinese studies, and some of the at-risk material, uh, which could be disappearing due to censorship and other issues. Um, there are also efforts by individuals and small groups of activ activists who respond to a particular cause, you know, where a, rap a rapid response was required in order to save content that wouldn't have been archived by any of the existing institutional programs. So I've given two examples there. Uh, first one is the archive team, supported by the Internet Archive, uh, led by my colleague Jason Scott. He has noted the readiness of, of corporations discontinuing, uh, discontinuing online services that are no longer profitable. So here, um, I'm talking about, the, for example, the AOL hometown in late 2008, and the GeoCities by Yahoo, both were discontinued by the organizations. And the Daily ASCII archive is um, operated or located at Macaster uh, University in Canada, which is um, concerning the 2012 libel suit against the academic librarian Dale, uh, uh, Dale ASCII. Um, so those are two examples of smaller organizations or groups uh, taking the responsibility of web archiving in their own hands. Because of the costs, commitment, and um, you know, infrastructure required to do web archiving in-house, there are also organizations turning into web archiving service providers. So the Internet Archive itself is a, you know, offer a range of uh, technology and services to suit the needs of such organizations. Another example is the Internet Memory Foundation based in France. For both these services, it's uh, interesting to note that the collections, while you know, the collections are built by different consumers of the service, or the, of the, the, the collections is open to everyone. And there are also commercial services. I've given an example there, which is the Hansel Archive in the UK. Um, they for example, archive for corporations such as Coca-Cola. This is purely for uh, in institutional or corporate records keeping. And in this case, the collection is closed. Uh, I think the last thing I want to mention is the, internet, uh, the International Internet Preservation Consortium, the IIPC, which is the global platform where institutions engaged in web archive meet and discuss and exchange practices. Um, so they meet annually. I just came back from their annual assembly in Reykjavik, Iceland. The next, next assembly will take place uh, in Lisbon, Portugal next year. So that's, in a nutshell, you know, the players in the web archiving landscape. Broadly, there are two approaches to collecting the web. Um, you know, the Internet Archive is no exception. The intention is to keep a snapshot of the global web. And for many national libraries, they archive periodically the national domain, represented by the country code top level domain name, for example, .uk for, for the United Kingdom, .fr for France. Um, so there are some boundary issues there when it comes to national effort to collect the web because the CCTLD is quite clear cut. But how about the content, for example, published by a UK organization or a person which isn't hosted on a .uk domain? How do you automatically identify and discover such content at scale? Many organizations, unlike the national organizations, selectively archive the web. They would take a subset of the national domain, for example, .ac.uk, .gov.uk, or they establish and build thematic event-based collections. We'll see a little bit, uh, a couple of examples later on, but the, the, for selective archiving, the aim is to focus on resources, web resources, considered to be particularly valuable 
or relevant to an organization's collecting remit. remit. Uh, because of its selective nature, you have to select something out of the, you know, the, the massive web. It actually uh, requires additional resources. Um, in reality, many actually use a combined strategy because the broad domain crawl is costly, takes a long time to, uh, to, to undertake. So what they do is they do the domain crawl and complement it with selective collections. I'm not going to go into details here, but this is a, the, the, this main technology used to undertake web archiving. The good news is that these are all open source technology with the, F, with the, you know, the, the knowledge of some common um, technology, an organization is possible to start web archiving without having to purchase, you know, off-the-shelf software. So, uh, essentially, you have the web crawler, where, which you use to ask a web server to give you a copy of a website. And sometimes we use extended modules to mimic the behavior of a browser so that the more advanced content can be captured as well. And then there is the Wayback software, not to be confused with the Wayback machine, which is the rendering or the access tool for archived web. And then there is uh, Natchbox and Solar. I'm really sorry about the acronyms. <laughs> Just remember these as software which help you to index the archived web pages so that you can search. And then there is also the WAC, which is the archival format, which is compressed format, which uh, is used for storing uh, archived web for long term. Uh, it's also an ISO standard. So many people doing web archiving, there is the Wayback Machine people go to to look at a historical version of the web. But do we have an idea who has done what? So the Memento protocol is a very handy service, a handy protocol in this context. So without going into the details, this is a lookup service built by the Bridge Library when I was there. It's based on metadata aggregated from several publicly available web archives. It's a method which allows you to seamlessly discover and deliver web pages regardless of who has archived them, where they are held. So what I've done here is I looked up the UST website. So I know that page has been archived 1,274 times and it sits in six archives. There you go, without doing anything, it's already being preserved. So the majority comes from the uh, Internet Archive. It's also in Bibliothèque Alexandria, but to me, it was surprising to see um, the um, web page, to, to see archived versions in the Portuguese and Icelandic web archive, for example. So th this really is a very handy method to string together the dispersed or distributed web archives around the world. So I, so I have included the URL there, that service is free, so should you be interested finding out who has archived your website, that's where to go. So I'm going to look at some key challenges now. I think um, it's correct to say web archiving is built on existing concepts, legislations, a network of libraries and archives, which is great, right? So we're making we are building on what we are familiar with. We're making use of existing infrastructure. But this in itself also brings the discourses. You know, we may not know very well, very well how to deal with some of the content. We deal with the digital side of things. Um, although being called uh, the a web archive, I think some of the physical or established uh, properties of an archive 
cannot be automatically assumed about a web archive. So for example, authenticity, integrity, how truthful an archived resource is to the original, and how inviolable this is against modification. I think this is especially questionable when you see that in a web archive, not all content can be captured. There are holes, and there are, and the way how the soft Wayback software works, and trying to be helpful by pulling, you know, content or resources crawled at different times, but put it on one page and show you as a single date time uh, marked page is questionable. You know, brings questions to this kind of uh, traditional concept. And also, if you examine the archived web, they are quite different. They are not the same as the live version, but it's also not, you know, the same as digitized material. So for scholars, this actually raises some uh, very fundamental methodological and conceptual questions. From the organization's point of view, especially for those working libraries and archives, the blurred distinction between publications, records, grey literature actually causes confusion around responsibilities. You know, whose responsibility is it? And what exactly is the National Library supposed to archive as opposed to National Archives? We talked about the boundary issues, you know, web as a global phenomenon, yet when it comes to preservation and archiving of it, in general, we take a national approach to it. The web actually doesn't have necessary boundaries, and it never ends. Um, technical challenges, I'll be brief. All I'm trying to say here is like, uh, while modern browsers virtually renders everything on the web, our purpose-built browsers are quite diff often defeated by the same pages, same, same web pages. So there are a lot of gaps in the web archives. We cannot archive the following. JavaScript, screaming and downloadable download media, password protected and paywall content, forms, database driven content, interactive content. So you have to imagine the crawler being a machine, not a person. So if you have to click a button, to go to the next page or to see something else, the crawler can't click the button. So that doesn't get archived, you know, by way of speaking. It's actually quite, quite a bit more complex than that. And how about social media? You know, the major ones, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook. They, they are a whole new class of technical challenges, you know, um, to archive. For those who deal with web archive at scale, Scalability is really hard. You know, there are over 480 billion pages in the Wayback Machine. Consider the, you know, how, how much work it is, how difficult it would be to full text index that and provide access. And there's also complexity in the entire web archiving process. I would say it's still quite a technical process. You know, temporary, temporary uh, inconsistency is actually quite a serious conceptual issue in my view. That's, you know, what I just briefly talked about. You know, pages marked with a single date time, but consisting of resources which were crawled at different times. You know, I think um, our scholars at uh, the US Old Dominion University done some research in 2014 and, con and sampled about 4,000 pages from different archives and concluded that at least 5% of the archive web pages as cert has certain temporal inconsistency or violation. So the newest and the oldest element of a rendered page from the web archive, the time span between that in the most extreme cases could be five or even 10 years. We have seen pages from the Icelandic web archive where the frames, you know, where frames has been used the main frame was captured like a few years ago, while the frame set itself, the content displaying in the frame, was captured you know, a few years later. So is that a authentic record of something? What is it? So.
this is my least favorite bit because I had to deal a great deal of it. So everyone doing web archiving has to deal with the legal challenges to a various degree. So to start with, is a copyrighted material. You can't just necessarily go out and archive them, but then there is the implied license, there are you know, fair dealings or fair use to consider, and for some national libraries, legal process gives you the um, opportunity to archive the web. The web contains, it's a container of a lot of things. It also contains, it contains, you know, scholarly material, contains um, pictures of ca uh, the cats, but also there is nudity, there is illegal content, there is libelous and defam defam defamatory content, and it also concerns personal data. When you collect all this information, allows data analytics, you actually surface and expose such content. So where do you draw the line? How do you deal with these issues? And also the rights to be forgotten has also often been raised in the context of web archiving. So you are familiar with this, the ECJ and Google case uh, in, uh, I think, a couple of years ago. So in the, uh, in the UK, actually, there is no formal or general rights to be forgotten uh, in, in the UK law. The Data Protection Act instead is used to examine the evidence of damage and distress to individuals in this case. I would always say that uh, web archiving really it's, it is about the rights to be remembered. You know, someone has got to keep a copy of, our, of the history of our time. And the fact that uh, web archives collected under legal deposit is usually um, only accessible on the National Library's uh, premise is also a way to control the potential damage here. And I think I've listed robots.txt there. Um, it's actually meant for machines to read. It's meant, not meant for lawyers or humans, but unfortunately, uh, it does play a quite an important role in web archiving. It's commonly used by webmasters to indicate whether they permit crawling by automatic uh, software or robots, it can be useful. So it can, sometimes they indicate, you know, don't go to this part of the website, otherwise your crawler will be, you know, entering an infinite loop. But sometimes if you obey robots.txt, you can't crawl back anything. So if they use a disallow everything, a wildcard disallow, you followed that, you can't capture anything. So it's actually, you know, although it's meant for machines, it has become a policy consideration. And the last point there, notice and takedown, is a commonly used method to deal with some of the legal challenges here. Well, so the eight years I was at the British Library being the head of web archiving, we had the team located in at least three different departments. It could be in IT, it could be in the in collections department, it could also be in digital processing department, right? But the, the, the question, the, the problem here is that web archiving requires a hybrid of skills. It doesn't fit necessarily, or it's not necessarily supported by the existing organizational uh, structure. And also um, collaboration, which obviously is a good thing, it actually adds quite a lot of complexity. In the case of the UK, legal deposit is a shared responsibility between six libraries. The British Library, the National Libraries of Wales and Scotland, uh, you know, uh, Trinity College in, in Dublin, uh, Modern Libraries and Cambridge University Libraries. So you have to replicate everything six times and make sure that the same content are accessed in six different places and the communication you know and everything else it just makes collaboration quite complex when it comes to selective archiving i think you know to me to select something you need to have a knowledge of the pool of things you are selecting from so if you ask me to select from these two things i know what i'm selecting from 
But when it comes to selecting website, because the, the pool of selection is so big, you know, quite often we actually don't explicitly know or we're not explicitly aware why something is selected and archived and why something isn't. And how about gaps and overlap, you know? Someone said, oh, don't worry about government websites. They are the most, um, you know, extensively archived um, portion of the web. So how about the gaps then? What websites are not archived by anyone? So it's this sort of services or protocol like Memento which can be helpful in finding out these gaps and overlap. So we uh, talked about authenticity. I think I'll skip that one. And also I think the, you know, as, a, as librarians, we know very well how to describe our resources. So we would typically describe selected website, we add metadata, we explain why we establish, establish a certain collection. But can you extend and scale it up to 400 billion pages? Obviously you can't. And how about quality assurance, which is currently mostly based on visual comparison of the live page and the page from the archive. You know, how much can you look at on a daily basis and how many people do you need to sustain that sort of approach? I think the very important question here relates to sustainability. The web grows. The costs to preserve the web grow as well. How do we sustain that? So, Traditionally, I think the libraries are very good at collecting resources. We, have set, we support our users using our collections, but I think access and use related to digital resources, especially archived web, is still quite a, you know, unknown, an unknown area. To start with, there seems to be some tension between the comprehensiveness of collection and the openness. So if you selectively archive websites, you worry about permission, you do all the right things, you put together a collection, but then researchers will tell you, that's great, but you don't have the material I'm interested in. The Internet Archive seems to have a very comprehensive collection. However, the Wayback Machine is, the discovery of the Wayback Machine is URL based. The focus really is some replay in the text. Without knowing the URL from the past, you can't find the things. So it's like, you know, there isn't an ideal situation here. And also because of this focus on replaying text, I think very little is actually explained or explicitly stated beyond HTML. So the, the temporal inconsistency I just mentioned uh, is one of the examples. I just uh, put a URL there, uh, which will lead you to an article I have written about some of the unknown aspects of web archives, including the temporal violation you know, and other things. Uh, so there is definitely the not enough versus too much issue there when it comes to uh, the use of web archives. And also I mentioned some methodological challenges. Uh, so here I would like to mention a uh, project which was funded uh, by the UK Art and Humanities Research Council. Uh, I was one of the co-investigators, um, co-PI of this, um, principal investigator of this project, which involved 10 humanities scholars, historians, um, social scientists, looking at a historical data set collected by the Internet Archive to see if these can be used as primary source of research. It was a very interesting project. Uh, so the case study I put up there is um, from Richard Deswatt, who works at the University of East Anglia. He wanted to examine the web pages from the past and understand, you know, the Euro skepticism, how it evolved in the UK web, which is a timely topic actually right now. <laughs> I don't know if we're going to be part of the EU. 
Um, but while citing Sarah, you know, Dep Deputy as one of the characteristics of the web, he also documented some of the unexpected pitfalls and challenges. For example, how difficult it is to actually form or formulate, establish a corpus which is relevant to his research from a much larger data set, and how you do that consistently. And also he asked the question, you know, is it because of me? Because I'm, I don't have expertise in textual analysis, in corpus linguistics, in data manipulation and clustering algorithms. These digital methods, are they a pre-request for me to be able to use the web archive effectively? Or am I Google-minded? You know, am I expecting Google when I use a historical web archive? So these are very interesting questions. And uh, on that website, actually, you'll be able to see all the other case studies. And there are many, many interesting um, use cases where scholars have used archived web to research one or other you know, uh, questions. So I'm going to uh, talk to you a little bit about the Internet Archive. So the Internet Archive is uh, based in California, in San Francisco, uh, in the United States. It's a not-for-profit digital library. It's funded by my boss, Brewster Kyle, in 1996, and our mission is universal access to all knowledge. So I'm going to throw some very big numbers at you. I'm not even going to read them out. <laughs> you know, I don't know. If, um, it, it is by far the largest digital library in the world. These figures actually are from April. I didn't even bother to update them. I, I know they are just, they're going up. And I know it's a big library. Um, 25 petabytes, about 12 are archived web. So I actually added the slides this morning, sitting there uh, listening to people talking about sustainability, environmental sustainability. This is where the um, data is stored, in these pedal boxes. Uh, it's a purpose-built, high-density and low-power storage system. It's originally uh, created to safely store and uh, process one petabyte of information, hence the pedal box. Actually, one rack, uh, I think, at the moment, uh, would be over uh, one point, you know, over one petabyte now. Um, so, an interesting thing to tell you is that uh, when I came to the Internet Archive headquarters, which is based in a former Greek church, I think, because the pillars looked, at, looked like the Internet Archive's logo, Brewster decided that should be our office. So, when you go into the building, you see the pedal boxes scattered in the great hall where, you know, People worship, used to worship. <laughs> uh, and also, there's no air conditioning as in you know, traditional data centers. So the, the heat generated by the service is used to help up, uh, heat up the building. So there you go. So we do web scale preservation. Uh, preservation. So all you need to know is the, that we archive, we carry out all kinds of crawls at any given time we have crawlers going out and fetching content back all the time. I think one billion URLs a week is cited and also there is the save page now feature which you can use to have pages archived on demand. So um, it has becoming it has become a invaluable resources for a lot of scholars and um, users in the world. 600,000 visitors cited a day, and there, there's also APIs to use to get information from the Wayback Machine. I'm going to skip this uh, slide. Just that you know, we have worked with many national libraries and archives. As a matter of fact, we do their domain cross for them. And the key software used for web archiving were developed and supported by the, inter uh, by the Internet Archive as well. So I'm going to focus a little bit now on Archive.it, which is a subscription service launched by the Internet Archive um, in February 2006. 
So it allows, it's a fully hosted web application for creating and managing um, web archive collections. Um, it is actually used by quite a lot of um, academic libraries. So there are 400 plus partners worldwide. 60% of them are university libraries, including all the US Ivy League universities. So um, most people, most of these are partners uh, are motivated, you know, uh, undertake web archiving because the, you know, um, collection building is one of the motivations, but also a mandate to capture and preserve uh, web history, meeting records, orientation requirements are all cited as uh, motivations by the archived partners. So I'm going to show you an example of the Latin American government documents archive based at the University of Texas, uh, which uh, contains um, a lot of um, official documents from different countries in Latin America. An example for, uh, is the, this is the Honduras uh, presidential website captured in 2008 before the coup. Look what happened during the coup. You get an Apache message saying, <laughs> web servers is working, but there's no content is taken off. And this is how it looks like after the coup. So this periodic you know, capturing of the same website or the same content, same pay URL, actually does show you sometimes what, has, what is happening. The Columbia University Library's uh, Human Rights Web Archive it's also quite interesting. So I actually wrote to them and asked, you know, how, how did you, why human rights? Why, you know, as early as 2008? So they actually um, received a number of grants from the Mellon Foundation, Foundation exploratory, project-based, uh, but from at some point, the university has made this program a strat strategic element of the library and started funding them from that point onwards. When asked about sustainability, uh, they said, well, the Mellon support in the beginning, which definitely was very helpful because it allowed us to train dedicated staff and obtain the skills. And also, what also is very important is that there is an existing comm commitment at uh, Columbia University Libraries to collecting physical archival material from hu human rights organizations and, activi and activists. So there is existing expertise at the university and engagement with uh, these such organizations. And there is, from the university, I think, you know, what sustained the, the, the funding for this for the web archive is the commitment to maintaining and growing the collection. So they currently archive uh, over 500 international human rights related websites. So here, here's a screenshot. I think this is Amnesty International. So I think I need to hurry up a little bit um, in order to support, you know, distant reading, data analytics. Uh, archive it has also a research service generating certain data sets based on partners' collections. Here is a result of um, such analysis. Using, the, um, using Columbia's um, human rights collection, uh, but looking at the top entities, uh, you know, in terms of people, organizations, and locations. This is, uh, you know, based on o October 2014 entities. So in an overview, it tells you what's in the collection. It's slightly different than looking at um, archived pages. So here are some more examples of how universities and other organizations creatively made use of Internet Archives, uh, the data collected by the Internet Archive. This is based um, at the LS3, L3S Research Center in, uh, uh, at the Hanover Leipzig University. Um, they have made use, you know, taken all the archived, about 200 archived collections and developed this interface on top, uh, which allows you to search the archive as well as the live web and also show you if should you be interested in one, in one of the 
archived web pages show you all the metadata, curated metadata there, which I think is a great idea. It also supports collaboration. You know, you can tag and comment on the resources, build your own collections. So this is based on quite uh, comprehensive uh, requirements engineering. Um, I think I probably need to uh, skip this. This is, yeah, okay, so this, all right. So, all, um, so this is uh, work done by Dr. Anat Ben David at the University of um, Israel, who made use of um, content archived by the Internet Archive to reconstruct the .yu domain, which was deleted from the Internet root table on 20th March 2010. So the entire formal Yugoslavia web domain disappeared. So uh, she actually did, you know, went through a lot of trouble to generate a list of URLs, which was previously in the YU domain, and then queried the Wayback Machine and managed to restore the former Yugoslavia web domain. About 53% of the URLs were found in the Wayback Machine. And she started also looking at, you know, the, to analyze the linking structure between the .yu domains and the rest of the web. So the blue one is um, the .yu website. It's clear that it's kind of, you know, the, the linking to the outside world became quite dense after the end of the Milosevic regime in, 2000, in the year 2000. And also it's only after the final split between Serbia and Montenegro in 2016 that the .yu domain started to, uh, to stabilize. So it's really interesting what you can do with this kind of data. More information there, the kind of research interest we have noticed, quite varied partnership we have with researchers. So I'm going to be slightly facetious here. So do we have a role here? What's the academic library's role? I think we should put that comment aside or that quote aside, think about the takeaways here. So the academic libraries, as we know, is changing. We still need to support teaching, learning, and research. And I don't think we can walk away anymore from the web. So there are options, different ones. You do it in-house, but it's quite technically challenging. The maintenance of technical infrastructure, the ongoing tools development and user support, and you need to have staff expertise, you have to train your staff, not just tech technical staff, but also curators. You can outs outsource it, but there are not many service providers out there, you know, I work for one, and also, you know, when you ask someone else to do something for you, you don't have direct control. You could use a combination of in-house and outsourcing options, you, you keep the core compon components in-house, and also you can use existing web archives. You know, there's a lot of ways to use the reuse and point to the Wayback Machine using the API. And there's also collaboration, you know, where like place in Hong Kong where there isn't a central library taking on the role of archiving the, the Hong Kong web domain. You know, maybe it's a joint responsibility. Maybe we should look at, you know, centralized infrastructure and technical services and develop collection development. That's another model. But there are some key cons uh, considerations, I think. You know, unlike a national library or web archives, which quite often have legal provisions for collecting and preserving content, web content forever, I think academic libraries are far less trustable for long-term archiving in that sense, because you need to decide yourselves. There isn't a piece of law which says you have to collect the web. You have to make that decision yourself. Why? And more importantly, why not? So I'm not saying all of you should do web archiving, but I'm, what I'm saying here is it needs to be an dis informed decision. Why or why not? You need to be really clear about your business needs. You must remember an archive is not a thing you put it there, you throw it away, it's a strategy. You know, you need to do your homework, think about the resources, you need to think about how you're going to collect the web, and also you need to decide 
if you're going to do it yourself or ask someone else to do it. Quite often, outsourcing and collaboration allow you to gain knowledge and experience. It's part of learning. You need to appraise the tools and services. You need to know your rights and risks. And I would always say, don't do the big band projects, wrong pilots, start small and, prog and progress. You need to consider access and use. It's not just about collecting. You know, how people use what we collect would in turn impact, change the way we archive and store this material. And I think you really need to also think about sustainability. To me, sustainability here is about the long time survival of the archive, even beyond you know, the, the, the existence of, this, of your organization. Should that happen, what do you do? I think there are two options. You know, you need to plan the exit strategy. Think how you keep your archive live. That's the ideal situation. If you can't do that, can you hand that over to someone else so that the archive can still be kept alive? How about the national libraries? What do you need to do for that to happen? So one thing springs to my mind, you know, you need to use common standards. You need to do things in the common way so that when someone takes over, it doesn't require a lot of effort to interpret what you have collected. So some pointers, you know, like beginner's guide, which are really handy. And also when you don't have the means to do things now, make sure the page, the, the web pages which are important to you are archived. So I've put a couple of URLs there. One is into archives, save page now. Um, if you, this is not just a manual thing. You can script around it. I think we accept about a few hundred URLs a minute, so you won't crash our service. <laughs> and also there's the um, Harvard uh, Law Library's PERMA CC service. Really is to combat the link rot uh, problem related to uh, referenced um, public scholarly publications. It's actually both are free to use. So before you have thought out you have thought about whether you do web archiving or not, if there are resources which are valuable, make use of these existing services. So, 20 years of web archiving. We have archived a portion of the web. We have a growing community and awareness. Um, legal issues are much better understand. Scholars are starting to use the web archive. I say that we need to focus on their revision, on portability and access. I say that we focus on partnerships and decentralization. There's still quite a dependence on the Internet Archive in general. And there's still concentration of web archiving activities in Europe and in North America. The world with one archive, with just one archive, is a bad thing. We need redundancy. We need to think about standards and the web technology. You know, technology used in the live web to archive the web. I think the full potential of web archives are yet to be exploited, and I would like to see more academic libraries from this part of the world at least start thinking about it. So on that note, I'll stop here. I'm very happy to take any questions you have. Right. So just that you know, these are the... So this is a video we put together which shows the real-time hosts being visited by our crawler. It takes a screenshot at the same time. Okay, I think we still have about five minutes, or perhaps seven or eight. So please, take a chance. Is there anything you want to ask, Helen? And you can, if you have questions, ask me, you know, out there as well. Yes. Helen, thank you. That was um, really interesting. Thank you. So I have a question about the sustainability of the funding model mm. for Internet Archive. Can you talk about that a little bit? If it sounds like one individual is responsible for uh, funding? 
that doesn't sound sustainable. So you mean how where the internal archives gets the funding from? Yes. So it's it's actually it comes from various uh, sources. So the uh, the internal archive I think um, has uh, so it receives donation from a lot of people, individuals and organizations support us. And there's also operational income because we provide services. And I think my boss still puts in some of his own money into the archive. So that's the three main sources of income or financial finance for the internal archive. Right. Yes. So, um, could you maybe tell us a little bit about how um, researchers are served at the Internet Archive? So, do you have um, services on site, um, or if somebody, if, an, if a researcher wants to do some sort of research, um, how do? How, uh, tell okay. me about your service model. A okay, bit. right. So, so there is the archive uh, services to start with, but uh, researchers typically, for example, are not. Uh, who did the um, Yugoslavia uh, domain reconstruction, she actually didn't contact us directly. She just used the API. Yeah. So quite often we team up with um, researchers. We, we go for collaborative uh, funding or project. So actually there is already quite a lot to do just, you know, using the API. And Archive it, I think, are developing uh, new APIs based on partners requirements to get more data, more metadata out of the archive. So I think the ideal situation really is that the baseline knowledge about the archive is there and understood so that they don't have to contact you for, for the archive to become the bottleneck to do, to do research. So I think that's where it's the go-to uh, to go state. Yeah. yeah. So perhaps the last question. Yes. There's one there. Yeah. Um, thank you for your presentation. Uh, you mentioned about social media and that you guys are not uh, doing it right now. Do um, you guys have any plans to um, go we're into not, that? We're not, not doing it. Okay. We're doing it. So, for example, if you go to the uh, Wayback Machine and look at uh, David Cameron's Twitter account, it's actually, to be honest with you, it's captured quite well. So, we... Ca capture so there is uh, Twitter and YouTube in the Wayback Machine, but the problem is that you know it's so you can crawl the HTML um, representation of the social media content as you see on the web, but the, the, many of these social media platforms also make data available through API, you know, in a different format. So there are questions as to which is the best way to archive social media, both as pros and cons. So the, actually at the moment, uh, the Internet Archive is scoping, is looking into develop a more, uh, a new service which can be used to archive social media more consistently and systematically. Now really it's depend, we use what we, we have and we capture what we can. It's best effort, but there are holes and also it, it's not meeting the, uh, in requirements uh, of, for uh, data mining, I think that's actually the primary uh, use case for social media content. Okay, thank you. So, okay. let's thank Helen again for her wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chen and Ms. Yu. Please stay. May I now invite Dr. Chen to present a souvenir to Ms. Yu.